أهلا بكم في اليوم الثالث والأخير للأسف الشديد من منتدى جدة الاقتصادي 2014 كان بودنا لو يطول هذا المنتدى أكثر ولكن أعتقد بأن ثلاثة أيام ربما تكون كافية للحفاظ على هذا الحضور العظيم فشكرا جزيلا لكم جلستنا لهذا اليوم ستكون مع كريس هيوز وهو رئيس تحرير ذا نيو ريبابليك وأحد مؤسسي موقع التواصل الاجتماعي الشهير فيسبوك يعد كريس هيوز من رواد الإعلام الاجتماعي والمبتكرين والكتاب الإصلاحيين والمهتمين بالأعمال الخيرية حيث يجسد الشاب المبتكر الناجح في جيل اليوم ويمثل التفكير المستنير في ريادة الأعمال والمنهج الفكري المبتكر الذي يتناسب مع سرعة التقدم في العالم الرقمي ويشتهر كريس هيوز بأنه من مؤسسي شبكة فيسبوك حيث تعاون مع زملائه من هارفارد في تحويل المفهوم البسيط لدليل الطلاب إلى ظاهرة عالمية تقدر بمليارات الدولارات ووضعوا أسس الإعلام الاجتماعي اليوم وغيروا الطريقة التي يرسل أو يرسل بها العالم المعلومات ويشاركها وينشرها طبعا بعد تأسيسه لفيسبوك نظم هيوز الحملة الرئاسية على شبكة الانترنت للرئيس الأمريكي باراك أوباما في العام 2008 من خلال الدمج بين قوة تأثير الإعلام الاجتماعي والسياسة وإعادة تشكيل مستقبل الحملات السياسية وأهله نجاحه غير المسبوق في هذا المجال إلى الحصول على لقب الشاب الذي جعل أوباما رئيساً والذي أطلقته عليه مجلة شركة فاست مؤخرا اشترى كريس هيوز مجلة ذا نيو ريبابليك التي اسست منذ 100 عام حيث يعمل فيها حاليا ناشرا ورئيسا لتحرير رحبوا معي ايها الساده بكريس هيوز رئيس تحرير ذا نيو ريبابليك Thank you. Good morning. First, let me thank the JETA Chamber of Commerce and Industry for inviting me here this morning. It's an honor for me to be able to speak to you all, and which is some of the most esteemed audience of the, of the region. As many people have asked me, this is my first time in Saudi Arabia, and I got a chance to tour some of JETA yesterday, which was absolutely extraordinary. So I'm very, very honored to be here. As we all know, we live in a time of dramatic disruption to the communications, technological, economic, and political paradigms of the 20th century. And as someone who considers himself a fairly close student of history, I'm always skeptical of the idea that this time it's different. As soon as someone says that we live in an era without precedent, my first inclination is always to look back in history and find forgotten periods that actually look much more like our own. But in the case of our time today, skeptics like myself must agree that we live in an era characterized by more rapid technological innovation than has ever existed before in the course of human history. The rise of the internet and the resulting revolutions in artificial intelligence and network systems have occurred faster and more broadly than any similar revolution in the past. Nearly every citizen of the world now owns a cell phone that connects them in seconds to just about anyone else, regardless of where they may be. Two billion people have access to the internet. And for just about anyone in this room, we have access to more information from devices in our pockets than our parents had in all the libraries 
of their lifetimes. And the rate at which general purpose technologies like smartphones and the internet are being adapted is growing faster. It took electric power about 40 years to be adopted by 80% of American households. The internet took just a decade. Smartphones have colonized half of the American market in half that time. And it's estimated that by the end of this year, the number of mobile connected devices will exceed the number of people on Earth. And by 2018, well over 3 billion people will have smartphones that are connected to the internet. A report just last month from Cisco predicts that by 2018, the Middle East and Africa in particular will have witnessed the strongest mobile data traffic growth of any region at a 70% compounded annual growth rate. At the same time this information technology revolution has occurred, we've also seen a new development in advanced economies. The rates of productivity of average workers in the developed world have continued to rise, but median wages have stagnated, or in some cases, like in my home country, even declined. Growth in productivity in the United States in the first decade of this century grew faster than in the 1990s, which in turn was faster than the 1980s and 1970s. But median incomes, the amount of money that the average worker is paid, in 2011 were 10% lower than just a decade before. If this trend continues, it suggests fundamental changes in the way not only the United States economy is organized, but economies all across the world. Technology may create a great deal more wealth, as we've seen, but the economic benefits may go to fewer and fewer people. So why would this be the case? Well, the authors of a recent book called The Second Machine Age, which I highly recommend that everyone read, invoke the popular tax software, TurboTax, to explain how these two trends are possible. Now, for any of you that don't know, in the United States, every citizen must fill out a form reporting their income for the year and submit it to the government. These forms, it won't surprise you, are not simple. And a vast number of taxpayers, historically, have sought out help from accountants and tax advisors to help them complete the process. This has now changed. Allow me to quote from the book. Recently, we overheard a businessman speaking loudly and cheerfully into his mobile phone. No way. I don't use a, a tax preparer anymore. I've switched to TurboTax software. It's only $49, and it's much quicker and more accurate. I love it. The businessman, of course, was better off. He had a better service, and it was at a lower price. Multiplied by millions of consumers, TurboTax has created a great deal of value for its users, not all of which even shows up in our classic statistics that measure economic development, like GDP. The creators of TurboTax, the entrepreneurs, are also better off. One's a billionaire. But tens of thousands of tax preparers now find their jobs and incomes threatened. If innovation continues to occur at this pace and its fruits go to smaller, a smaller group of entrepreneurs rather than mass workers, it will call into, basic, into, into question basic assumptions about employment and what governments must do to support everyday people. Every nation in the world will likely have to wrestle with these questions in the long term, even Saudi Arabia. And as has been discussed over here over the past two days, projected growth in GDP for the Middle East over the next few years suggests that there are significant opportunities for economic growth and diversification. 
but youth unemployment remains among the highest in the world. So the question in front of us today is, how do we deliver long-term, sustainable growth that empowers as many people, particularly young people, to get as close as possible to full employment? Of course, the answers to this question are many and varied, and they call into question fundamental assumptions of economic and social policy. And given that I am no economist, I'll let the other experts at this forum speak to specific economic policy recommendations. Today, I want to focus on one of the most essential drivers for any kind of robust, diverse economy that enfranchises the young and the old alike, entrepreneurship. There's a massive difference between a business manager and an entrepreneur. The term entrepreneur itself took on its current meaning relatively recently, in the middle of the 19th century, just as the seeds of the Industrial Revolution, of course, a time of staggering entrepreneurship, were being sown. Now, whereas a business manager keeps a steady, guiding hand as a business grows, an entrepreneur takes on something new, introducing an element of risk, but also the potential for very large rewards. Entrepreneurship and creativity are difficult things to engineer. And unfortunately, it's not so easy just to throw money at the problem. In order to create a country that values entrepreneurship, I argue you must work on two levels. First, on the level of culture, and second, on the level of institutions. Before we start with the how, though, let's just take one moment to consider the barriers that a young person here in Saudi Arabia likely feels today. Put yourself in the shoes of a 25-year-old who is sorting through what to do with his or her life. You're fresh to the workplace, inexperienced, and likely terrified of failure, particularly at the start of your career. In a culture with few entrepreneurs, there are not many role models. And because you are young, you have no experience managing people. You likely do not have a robust network of contacts or mentors. And you probably do not have access, or at least easy access, to what we call smart capital, capital that's ready to invest and be a value add for your business. In fact, society seems to be doing everything it can to stop you from breaking out and starting something new. Well, it doesn't have to be this way. In my talk today, I want to suggest six methods for encouraging entrepreneurship. Three that have to do with culture, and three that have to do with financial and governmental institutions. There are many more ingredients to creating an entrepreneurial society than these six, but I've tried to consolidate many of the ideas for the sake of brevity and to stay within my allotted time. My intent today is not to lecture or suggest that Saudi Arabia just imitate all the ways of Silicon Valley or the ways of American entrepreneurs. The traditions and culture of this place is different. But I do think that there are some lessons to be learned, which I offer as suggestions for a path forward to create a more entrepreneurial and thus economic, a more economically robust Saudi Arabia and Middle East. I'd like to start with three guidelines that have to do with creating an entrepreneurial culture. Now, by this point, 
many of you will likely know the basics of the Facebook founding story. Mark Zuckerberg, Dustin Moskovitz, and I were all roommates at Harvard in February of, of 2004 when we launched the Facebook.com to our friends and peers. We were an unlikely band. Mark was studying psychology and computer science, <clears throat> Dustin economics, and myself, history and literature, of all things. And contrary to what some of you may have seen in the Hollywood movie, The Social Network, our days and nights were not filled with illicit sex and alcohol-powered hackathons. It was much more prosaic and boring than that, at least what I experienced. Instead, we were a few college kids who got into the habit of cooking up new ideas. Harvard gave us the skills to take those ideas to the prototype phase. Risky investors in Silicon Valley later gave us the capital to transition a quickly growing but simple website into a mature company. <clears throat> but what you don't hear in all the mythologizing of Facebook's success is that two prior projects that emerged from our dorm room failed. That's right. Facebook came in the wake of two meaningful failures. The first was called Course Match and was a service for undergraduates to, at Harvard to find what classes their friends were thinking about taking so that they too could go and visit the class and evaluate whether or not they wanted to enroll. The second was a version of a dating site that enabled its users to compare the attractiveness of their fellow peers. Suffice it to say, it was not our most mature idea and the university shut it down pretty fast. But you see, when we talk about entrepreneurship, or we talk about entrepreneurial leaders, we tend to focus on the top line big successes rather than the smaller ones or even their failures. We talk at length about Steve Jobs' incredible success with Apple, but rarely about his failure with the next computer. WhatsApp is an app that was recently acquired by Facebook for $16 billion, but the two founders of that company had failed to be hired, had been rejected by Facebook and Twitter just years earlier. This is the first guideline for encouraging a culture of entrepreneurship here in Saudi Arabia. Celebrate failure. We need to be realistic. Entrepreneurship is a risky business. When all you start out with is a simple idea, you have no idea of the complexity of the challenges that you're gonna face. Is there a market for this product? What is the product in the first place? Is it even possible to create it in a way that is capital efficient? Can I find and recruit enough people who can not only build an initial version, but also help it scale and create a functional enterprise? In many cases, the answer to these questions will be no. And in many cases, there'll be no way of discovering what is true until an entrepreneur tries. Right now, today, in the Apple App Store, there are estimated to be over a million applications that have been created in the past few years. And of those, maybe a few thousand, at best, have been successful. That suggests that a tiny percentage of the attempts, actually less than 1%, actually succeed to become meaningful, widely used products, let alone businesses. Across cultures, our natural inclination is to shy away from failure. Nothing is more embarrassing to any one of us, young or old, 
than to have other, people's think, uh, other people think that we haven't amounted to much or we haven't been good at what we set out to do. But in a culture that doesn't embrace failure, we stop people from taking the necessary risks that are a fundamental and important part of what entrepreneurship is in the first place. Creating a cultural culture in which entrepreneurs flourish means creating a culture where people are encouraged to fail early and often. Of course, there are multiple ways to recover from failure. A successful entrepreneur takes stock of what she or he did that worked and didn't work and then bounces back to try and try again. Learning from failure is really where the real art of entrepreneurship can be witnessed. Megan McArdle has a new book out called The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. In it, she tells an old proverb. I'll quote. There's a famous story of a rich old man being interviewed by a young striver who asks him for the secret of his success. Good judgment, says the magnate. His eager young follower dutifully scribbles this down and then looks at him expectantly. And how do you get good judgment? Experience, says the terse tycoon. And how do you get experience? Bad judgment. You see, entrepreneurship requires making mistakes and then redoubling your commitment to persevere and acknowledging that creating something out of nothing is difficult and doesn't happen overnight. But unless we create a culture where failure is admitted to and embraced, no real culture of entrepreneurship can take root. The second gu guideline I have today for creating a culture of entrepreneurship is almost as simple as the first, and in many cases might be so self-evident that it's easy to skip over and ignore. Help entrepreneurs find each other. Too often we think of entrepreneurs only as business people. In fact, when most people hear the word entrepreneur, they think of a businessman out to create a company to take over a sector of the economy. In reality, entrepreneurship is an attribute of all kinds of people, of engineers, salespeople, financial planners, marketers, event organizers, the list goes on. And for any kind of startup to take off, it needs a team of diverse people. Some are builders, some are promoters, some are operators and organizers. The vast majority of entrepreneurs in the United States and across the globe don't study business in college. They study the fields they're passionate about and then use those skills to birth new ideas and contribute to a team building something out of nothing. The challenge in encouraging a new entrepreneurial culture I think, is to provide physical spaces that make it possible for entrepreneurs to easily find one another and begin to collaborate. In the United States, cities and towns across the country are constantly trying to mimic the success of Silicon Valley, which as you know is the home of almost all the major consumer technology companies that are used throughout the world today. But I would suggest that the right place to start isn't on the level of something as large as a city or even a town, but more narrow, on the level of a building or maybe even the floor of one. Three years ago, a friend of mine in New York, Adam Pritzker, had the idea to create a co-working space called General Assembly in the middle of the Flatiron neighborhood of New York City. Now New York is a great city, but it has been more known for its finance, fashion, and media sectors than a startup 
or entrepreneurial one. General Assembly aimed to change that. They took over one floor of one building in a city of 8 million people to start. They offered cheap desks to entrepreneurs who needed a place to work. They created an educational curriculum for anyone to take classes to learn the fundamentals of a startup business, how to code, how to design, how to become a product manager. They made it easy for entrepreneurs with new ideas to access lawyers and investors, the kinds of people that, for that 25-year-old that I started talking about at the beginning of, of my talk, it's very hard to get access to or to even find. And they did all this within a space of no more than 10,000 feet, not anywhere near the size of the room that we're in today. Today, General Assembly now has 13 locations, including ones in Hong Kong, Sydney, and Berlin, and it's taught 100,000 people in person and, th and digitally since its start. In just a few years' time, they've helped revolutionize the startup community in New York and build a global business of their own. Even in a world where more and more of our relationships are digitally mediated, geography and physical proximity are important. Free economic zones and entrepreneurial cities are a good thing, don't get me wrong. But I would start even more narrowly, even more specifically. It's more powerful to have a culture, a strong culture of entrepreneurship felt among a few dozen innovators than to have large-scale initiatives that lightly touch tens of thousands. My third suggestion for encouraging entrepreneurship here in Saudi Arabia is to embrace diversity. Entrepreneurship is a creative process by its very definition, where the more ideas, questions, and experiences that are in the mix, the better. Having everyone around the table look alike, talk alike, and think alike opens you up to enormous problems on down the road because it crowds out new and innovative ideas before they can be discussed. The first rule of entrepreneurship could be phrased as simply as, you don't know what you don't know. And the more diverse minds that you have around the table, the more likely you are to close off your blind spots. But you don't have to take my word for it. A good empirical study from a few years ago suggests that social diversity and creativity have a positive relationship to new firm foundation formations. It's been generally well known that the quality of human capital, the quality of the people in any company, directly ref uh, affects the rates of entrepreneurship. But it's also now growing increasingly clear that a diverse culture facilitates the influx of a particular kind of human capital that promotes innovation and accelerates information flow, leading to a higher rate of entrepreneurship and business creation. If you're trying to develop new ideas and new businesses to access an untapped market, you will naturally want to bring potential customers or users directly into the ideation, product design, and implementation processes. In Saudi Arabia, opening up this process to people from all different classes, from both genders, will build stronger communities and make, them more, make these businesses more likely to succeed. Entrepreneurial teams are much more likely 
to flourish when they have multiple perspectives who challenge one another in the arduous, time-consuming, but critical process of reaching consensus. Let me pause here to say that all three of these guidelines that I've just suggested so far are really cultural in nature. They're the kind of changes that can't be brought about instantly by a new administrative policy or the passage of a certain law. I begin with them in some ways because I think they're the hardest changes to implement. They require evolving hearts and minds, and that takes time. So let's turn to a second set of three guidelines that have more to do with institutions, financial, governmental, than culture, and are easier to move more quickly. The first of these three is a bit of advice for government, and it may seem a little counterintuitive to come from an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. It's to invest in research and development on a governmental level. One of the big secrets of the success in Silicon Valley in the United States is the massive amount of support that both emerging and very large established companies receive from the government. This support doesn't come in the form of subsidies or even particular tax breaks. Instead, it comes from the budgets of US government research and development programs. Contrary to popular understanding, venture capital, the term for early stage financing of startup companies, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, is not particularly good at finding solutions to some of the hardest and most complex problems that we have. In reality, the most successful governments, particularly the United States and Germany, have developed robust systems of innovation on top of which entrepreneurs and venture capitalists can build. These governments invest in large, open-ended research that powers growth in the private sector. Let's take a specific example, as Mariana Mazzucato does in a new book called The Entrepreneurial State. Let's take something as simple and nearly universal as the iPhone. The iPhone was released in 2007 to much fan fanfare, and today it's estimated that around 450 million devices have been sold worldwide. Steve Jobs has been rightly memorialized for the creativity and commitment that he showed in developing a device that was unthinkable to almost everyone just a few years before. But almost all of the major components of the iPhone trace their existence back to government-funded research and development. The processors the iPods, iPhones, and iPads use evolve from research on giant magnetoresistance that was funded by Germany and France. The multi-touch screen technology was originally developed by researchers at the University of Delaware, a state in the United States, as part of the National Science Foundation. These researchers then started a company called Fingerworks that was acquired by Apple in 2005. Siri, the voice recognition software in recent iPhones, was acquired by Apple in 2010. But it grew out of a defense research product project at the Stanford Research Institute, SRI. Similarly, the GPS functionality that powers all of our map applications and the, lo and the location relevant maps, apps like Foursquare, exists because over our heads, the United States government has over 20 GPS satellites floating above the Earth. And perhaps most fundamentally and importantly, the internet itself emerged from a defense-related project of the US government in the 1970s and 1980s. I say all of this not to undermine the entrepreneurial spirit and perseverance of someone like Steve Jobs, because he, after all, brought together so many of these innovations in a single consumer-friendly device. 
I say all of them, though, to highlight that government research and development can unearth and develop nascent ideas to a point after which entrepreneurs can pick them up, adapt them for the consumer, and build. The second institutional guideline or suggestion I have is to encourage the development of early stage financing, often called venture capital. Now, I, I said earlier that venture capital isn't ideal for funding difficult scientific breakthroughs, and that is true. But it is absolutely required to create a culture of entrepreneurship. As many of you know, the classic approach of venture capitalists is to invest early in a business that holds promise but is far from being fully formed. The investor takes meaningful risk and oftentimes expects only one or two investments out of every 10 she or he makes to succeed. Venture capitalists often make important financial decisions based more on the seed of an idea or the personalities involved as a careful economic analysis of the surrounding market. They do ample research to understand or scope a sector, but they tend to go with their gut in selecting the right team, particularly in the early stages. Just as the entrepreneur is taking enormous risk, so too do they. Creating a thriving venture capital sector in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia might require rethinking investment guidelines and some of the legal structures that are in place. But of all places in the world, the wealthy and successful in Saudi Arabia have enormous capacity to deploy a small portion of their capital toward early stage startups here, and they should. The government could even partner to lead an initiative like this, committing to match private sector investment in certain kinds of companies up to a certain point when they exit their most riskiest stages. <laughs> Assuming a culture of entrepreneurship develops, this could be just as lucrative a decision, just as profitable a decision, as an impactful one on the startup ecosystem. My final and perhaps most important institutional suggestion is to invest in your greatest potential natural resource here. And that's not oil, it's your people. Most of the time when people talk about investing in entrepreneurial education, they mean deepening students' aptitude for science, technology, engineering, math, and similar topics. Similarly, the study of business, finance, accounting, marketing, all of these are also perceived to be important topics to encourage entrepreneurship. And those who advocate for more funding of these are absolutely right. We need more STEM and basic business education in economies that are trying to incentivize entrepreneurship. But they alone are not enough. There is no substitute for an education across multiple topics, including history, political theory, the arts, literature, philosophy, that creates a culture of critical thinking. An entrepreneurial culture has at its very foundation two fundamental practices, skepticism and creativity. Neither of these practices can be easily taught. They must be cultivated. While traditional schools emphasize rote memorization or basic skill acquisition, a liberal arts education, as we call it in the United States, asks students to ask questions and personally engage with the topics they study and to question why they matter in the first place. This kind of creative thinking is part and parcel of the entrepreneurial process. I believe any entrepreneurial endeavor is, at its heart, idealistic. It believes that something should exist that does not yet. 
That requires the entrepreneur to be dissatisfied and skeptical of the status quo, of the way things are. A liberal arts education teaches students to question why things are the way they are and to think creatively about how they should be in the future. This process of questioning, wondering out loud, and inventing was not only behind Facebook and Google, but behind the technologies that powered the steam engine and the light bulb. Now, in traditional societies like this one, I have no doubt that the notion of teaching students to question and to doubt may seem highly Western and potentially even incendiary. But the spark of entrepreneurial creativity emerges from the mind that believes that the world tomorrow can be better than the world today. In order to imagine the Facebooks of the future, young people have to feel that they have the ability, the power to birth new ideas and then see them become a reality. Entrepreneurship in any field requires a sense of, of hubris, a belief that a certain idea, product, company might not exist if I don't pursue it. That kind of creativity and drive is to be cultivated, admired, and rewarded. It is this ambition, this desire to have an impact on the world that animates entrepreneurs everywhere. And I can guarantee you there are tens of thousands of invincible, of invisible entrepreneurs hiding, hovering in the background of this country today, just waiting to make their entrance onto the world stage. Our challenge is to create the culture and the institutions that help these entrepreneurs come out of the shadows, step up to the plate, and try to turn a simple idea into a viable business, maybe even the next Facebook. Let's do everything we can to help them succeed. Thank you. طبعا شكرا للسيد كريس هيوز المؤسس المشارك في فيسبوك ونؤكد على عدد من النقاط البارزة التي أشار إليها بأن الاستثمار هو في الشباب وليس في النفط فقط فإن الشباب هم أساس المجتمع ومستقبله أتمنى من الأستاذ مازن بترجي نائب رئيس المجلس مجلس إدارة الغرفة التجارية الصناعية بجدة تكرم الصعود إلى المسرح لتقديم دراسة تذكارية للسيد هيوز طبعا السيد هيوز سيستمر معنا في الجلسة الثانية وهي بعنوان التحديات وعوامل التمكين سيشارك في هذه الجلسة السيد رضا إسلام السيد فريد كرمستجي وأيضا السيد عبد المحسن بن مراهيم البدر والسيد جيرمي ليدل والسيد غروغرا سنتلس والسيد كريس هيوز سنكون في هذه الجلسة بعد ثواني من الآن